Welcome to the Retail Focus Podcast, a weekly collection of news, interviews, and information from the world of retail. Welcome to this edition of the Retail Focus Podcast. I'm Trent Kling for Layton, working behind the scenes. Coming up on this week's episode, we'll be joined by Dan Surtees of XC Commerce. XC Commerce is a platform that really drives promotions for a number of retailers in the U.S. L Brands, Asina Retail Group, Maurice's among them. He'll talk a little bit about the scope of promotional platforms in 2022 the intricacies that go into developing a promotion platform that should work across brands. For example, Asina Retail Group runs multiple brands, and so important to make a promotion platform that works for all of those individually and for their individual constituents. We'll also talk about the importance of flexibility in promotion platforms where some of that flexibility really didn't exist just a few years ago. As far as news is concerned, we'll be discussing some holiday sales updates from a few different retailers, three different retailers, in fact, and we'll be looking ahead to an expansion of a natural food chain that has recently taken over and is seeking to kind of re-expand their presence throughout the United States. A quick reminder that you can check us out on social media at Retail Podcast, both Twitter and Instagram. Also, if you enjoy the show, you can certainly give us a positive rating. Those positive ratings help others to find us in the big algorithm-driven world of podcasts. So again, if you like the show, you like the interviews we have every week, we'd certainly love it if you left us one of those positive reviews. Well, let's talk now about the holiday sales updates from multiple retailers. Now, we'll talk about Bed Bath & Beyond here specifically in a second. I did want to mention that MasterCard data, according to MasterCard Spending Pulse at least, indicated that grocery sales as a whole climbed over 8% in December. You're looking at sales increases near 17% on a two-year stack, so it looks as though grocery on the whole, had a very good December. And Costco also provided their monthly sales updates. Not something they only do around the holiday season. They do it pretty much the entire year around. But net sales for Costco grew 16.2% year over year for the five weeks ending December 28th. Comp club sales were up 11.5%, excluding fuel. So some positivity there, but... As I mentioned, Bed Bath & Beyond gave us a bit more of a thorough outlook. This really came from an earnings call rather than a holiday sales update. The earnings call is for their third quarter. They did update fourth quarter expectations based on the numbers they've gotten so far. They apparently were one of the retailers who really took it on the chin from supply chain issues. At least Bed Bath & Beyond did. Bed Bath & Beyond lost comp sales to the tune of 10% in the third quarter. CEO Mark Tritton said that customer demand was still there, but there was a lack of availability as far as replenishment inventory for things that had been wiped off the shelves. Now, if Bye Bye Baby, their other brand or their other large brand, was impacted, certainly didn't show in comps there. Comps were up mid-teens. As a firm, though, comps dropped 7%. These supply chain issues, these stocking issues, impacted them, they said, by about $100 million. That equates to around a mid-single-digit decline firm-wide. In theory, you look at the numbers, comp sales fell a bit further than this, so the decline in comp sales wasn't entirely due to supply chain, just to a large extent. And it's interesting, you think back really over the last 24 months, you really have to wonder if leadership's goal to carry less inventory on a store-by-store basis might have hampered them in the third quarter going into the holiday season as obviously they couldn't have foreseen supply chain issues lasting this long. So maybe tough to blame leadership per se, but that initiative that they've been on to try and reduce that in-store inventory just a little bit as part of their in-store refreshes probably didn't help matters as far as their sales are concerned. Now, as regards the fourth quarter, they provided updates The impact of supply chain stresses was said to be even worse as they got into December. As such, they adjusted earnings expectations. They now expect earnings per share for the fourth quarter to come in flat 
to up 15 cents or positive earnings of 15 cents. FactSet consensus estimates prior to this update pegged them at earnings per share of 70 cents for the fourth quarter. So a big discrepancy there between expectations and the likely numbers that we'll see for the fourth quarter for Bed Bath & Beyond as a company. As I mentioned, December in particular was said to be a big struggle for them, not in terms of demand or traffic, but in terms of those in-stocks. Lack of in-stocks meant a lack of sales. Top line taking a hit, comp taking a hit. This isn't a great look for a company who is fighting to win back their customer base in the first place. We remember the pre-Mark Tritton struggles. They'd been doing pretty well in the first couple of quarters of this year. They still expect aggregate comps for the entire year to be positive, but not a great sign for Mark Tritton and company. Now let's talk about his former employer in Target. Now Target seemed to have a strong holiday season anecdotally, but this was confirmed in a Reuters report that came out this week on traffic numbers from November 1st to December 25th. According to the third-party shopper location data quoted by Reuters, it came from Placer.ai, which is, if you're in the retail industry, certainly know about what they do and how they track things, but basically tracking mobile device user locations at brick-and-mortar stores throughout the country. But according to this data, traffic at brick-and-mortar Target stores rose 6.2% over 2019. That's right, rose 6% over pre-pandemic levels, not to mention over last year. Meanwhile, the same data set had foot traffic down slightly at Walmart versus 2019, looking at a tenth of a percent of a decline there, down by 11.5% at Best Buy. Now, that doesn't mean either of these other retailers struggled on the sales front. In fact, both are expected to improve over 2019 per Refinitiv reports, just that they weren't able to drive Quite the in-store traffic increases that Target saw, and you would think this would portend excellent sales numbers coming out for the quarter for Target. Now, Target themselves haven't reported holiday sales as yet or provided any updates, but Refinitiv numbers do expect an increase of over 30% versus 2019. They've had a strong fiscal year in terms of comps, and you would have to think that'll continue once we do get those holiday sales in for Target. But certainly credit to CEO Brian Cornell and the entire team at Target for getting those traffic numbers up against a backdrop where you would think that would absolutely not be possible to do versus 2019, a holiday season that towards the tail end saw really that onset of Omicron, the newest COVID variant. You saw Delta issues at the beginning of the holiday season. So for Target to be doing this in a pandemic, Really quite remarkable for them. And moving on to a final retailer we wanted to take a glance at that provided us updates this week, Bath & Body Works. As is typical of the former L Brands holding, now traded separately, of course, on the New York Stock Exchange, they provided holiday sales guidance in a way by providing updated Q4 earnings guidance. Specifics regarding comps were missing, but indications are that certainly sales were robust during November and December for Bath & Body Works. Management confirmed likely earnings per share on the high end of their previous guidance. It was set originally from 210 to 225 per share. For context, last year this number was $1.96 per share. They also expect sales numbers at the high end of their previous guidance, which called for increases of mid to high single digits on a percentage basis. Likely to see those come in at high single digits on the top line. Like I said, didn't provide any guidance as far as comps were concerned. CEO Andrew Meslow was quoted as noting that their stores were able to provide, and I quote, a full and compelling merchandise assortment for their customers. He particularly noted the hard work of their distribution and fulfillment divisions. So they didn't seem to experience some of those same supply chain woes as Bed Bath & Beyond, and we'll see if, say, a retailer like Target reports on many of the supply chain woes for the most recent quarter. Categorically for Bath and Body Works, body care and home fragrances were up, soap and sanitizers down versus 2020. And certainly that's something you can see is sanitizers and soap, both two of the most popular items across all retailers during 2020, kind of in that first year of the pandemic. 
Cadence-wise, the week before Christmas was noted as being particularly strong year over year for Bath and Body Works. Not all is roses, though. They're currently in the midst of their semi-annual sale. Leadership said that's performing below their expectations currently, and they noted that they'll have to make some adjustments to their promotions on the fly to kind of ensure an inventory clean slate for the 2022 fiscal year, something that's very important for them to do in their semi-annual sale because of the seasonality of so many of their products. And by the way, look at that transition. XC Commerce has for some time handled the promotional platforms for L Brands, which included Bath & Body Works. And after this break, we'll be joined by Dan Surtees of XC Commerce. He'll talk about the importance of flexibility in promotion platforms, the type of flexibility that Bath & Body Works is planning to leverage in their semi-annual sale going on right now, as well as the intricacies of creating promotion platforms for multiple brands and multiple customer groups that a single company might have. It's a fascinating conversation. Honestly, promotion platforms, not something we talk a lot about on the show, but so important as far as driving traffic. And Dan will shine some light on it after this. We hear retailers often discuss the importance of an effective promotion platform, both in terms of winning new customers and retaining existing ones. But a lot goes into the development of such platforms to ensure that everything is optimized and, most importantly, that the platforms themselves are effective. Moreover, for companies attempting to develop platforms that function across different brands, across different labels, the difficulty level is ratcheted up even further. Now, joining us to discuss these matters, promotion platforms and the like, especially as they pertain to apparel retail, is Dan Surtees. Dan is the Vice President of Strategy and Business Development at XC Commerce. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks, Trent, and thanks for the introduction. You bet. Just so our audience knows kind of the perspective that you bring to this conversation, what does XC Commerce kind of do on the day-to-day? That's a great question, Trent, and thanks. XC Commerce is about delivering retail promotion excellence. And what I mean by that is we provide retailers a standalone promotion execution and management solution that delivers consistent execution of promotions across all sales channels, all banners, all brands, and across the entire enterprise. And that covers the global markets as well. But simply put, our promotion and offer management platform enables streamlined, consistent execution of complex overlapping offers across channels, devices, banners, locations, and loyalty status. And it empowers marketing, simplifying operations and ensuring every shopper receives the offer and experience you as a retailer intend. Like I said, retail promotion excellence. And that's what we've been doing for the past 20 years for retailers all across North America. And also, again, for perspective's sake, what are some of the retailers that you currently partner with there? So just as a sampling of some of the retailers that we work with, Tailored Brands, which covers off the brands of Men's Warehouse, KNG Fashion Superstore, Joseph A. Bank. Then we have Asina, which includes currently brands of Ann Taylor, Lane Bryant, and Loft, and previously other brands as well, including Maurice's, which once they were sold off, they're still a client of ours, and we continue to work with them. L Brands, which includes Victoria's Secret, Bath & Body Works, LL Bean, and Belk. Now, within the Canadian market, we also have Metro Grocery and Pharmacy, Shoppers Drug Mart, and Indigo Books, which are three of the bigger retailers here in Canada. And quite a few large retailers in the United States as well. So we were kind of talking before the recording, but developing an effective promotion platform today requires a lot more consideration as far as various channels, various different aspects than it might have 20 or 30 years ago. What all goes into developing an effective promotion platform today in 2022? Well, the first thing we need people to understand 
is that a sophisticated promotion platform is more than simple discounting or slashing prices. A lot of people look at promotions as simply reducing a price. Well, we've been working with the leading retailers for years and they see it much, much broader than that. And here's what they're looking for in a promotion solution. Number one is cross channel. And we've seen this really explode over the past couple of years, right? Where there's the addition of a number of different channels out there, digital channels, buy online, pick up in store, et cetera, right? You need a system that can handle all of these channels as you grow, not just what you have today. The challenge is retailers sometimes will have a solution, a promotion solution that is for one channel only. And in the end, what you end up with is a hodgepodge of different promotion solutions and platforms to cover across your number of different brands, channels, et cetera. And that becomes an operational nightmare. So you need a solution. When you're building a solution and considering a solution, you need something that's cross-platform to handle all of your platforms and all of your brands. A lot of what I do, Trent, in my day is explain to retailers that there is a solution out there to a problem they didn't know existed. And I give you a very simple and brief example. We talked to a very well-known retailer. We were talking to them and early on in the conversations. They said that they have something like seven or eight disparate promotion systems today to cover the multiple channels, the global markets that they cover off. And you start to think about the logistical nightmare of trying to manage promotions across an enterprise in seven or eight different systems. And what the other side of what you get is, I call it the lowest common denominator. Well, we can't run that, even though these three systems can run that promotion, these four systems can't, therefore we can't really have that promotion across our entire enterprise. So we have to go to the lowest common denominator. So again, it's an operational nightmare and more and more when I talk to retailers, they don't realize that they have this problem because it's just the way they've been doing business for the past, whatever number of years, and they don't know any better. It just kind of creeped up on, they start off with one POS solution and that POS solution came with a promotion platform. Okay, great. Now you got another POS system. Now you got another e-commerce solution or two or three, you got a brand and a new brand in there. And all of a sudden you've got four or five, right? So it's a problem that most people don't realize they have and that there's a solution out there. Second thing is it lends a little bit to what I just talked about is future proofing, right? Now we all know the retail industry is incredibly dynamic, new trends, technologies, channels, and expansion into regional and global markets. So you can't just think about today when you're thinking about a retail platform. You need a solution that supports you now and into the future and even into the unknown. Coming back a little bit to the apparel world, right? Flexibility, and this applies across all verticals, but largely a lot with apparel as well. Each brand has to have that flexibility and the ability to create their own promotions and offers. What works well for one brand may not be the answer for others. And last, but certainly not least, right, especially in the retail industry, and as, as we've just gone through the holiday season, speed and scalability. No consumer wants to wait, whether it's standing in line at a store while a cashier goes through the checkout process and the promotion execution system is taking too long because the basket size is too big. So whether it's in-store or online, nobody wants to wait. And these spikes and volumes that we get in the retail industry with the Black Fridays, Cyber Mondays, and the holiday season or semi-annual sales, those spikes and volumes can't slow down your processing and your systems because these are in your sales channels, the execution of your sales transactions, lightning fast and the ability to scale as volumes increase. I would say those are the key things to consider when building out an effective promotion platform. So you talked about a number of considerations. One of them was flexibility, specifically as it pertains to the apparel landscape. And you mentioned, of course, Asina, one of the retailers you work with. I think they're a great example of that. They used to have the Maurice's banner, obviously serving different customer groups, different demographics than maybe Ann Taylor or Loft. 
What are some specific considerations that maybe go into developing an effective platform that works across brands for a particular retail company? The flexibility side of things, right, is key because especially for someone like Asina who has their different brands, it's not the same target audience. So they have to create promotions that are a little bit different for each of their brands. So again, one solution doesn't fit all. So you have to create that flexibility across the various different brands and be able to promote on anything in any way. So the way XC Commerce looks at it is we don't want to restrict the retailer or the brand on the types of promotions they run. Typically, promotion platforms will say, here's the promotion types that you have. And it would be a, a small selection of promotion types or a large selection of promotion types. But the challenge is you're now painted into a corner. You can only promote on those items. So when you are working across multiple different brands with multiple different target audiences, you need some flexibility on how you do promotions and what types of promotions will work for your brand. And that was a key for Asina. So the ability and the flexibility to create any promotion type is what XC Commerce provides, right? We don't restrict the retailer or the brand. We don't tell them how to run their business. They know how to run their business best. They know their customers the best. So what we do is we provide them the ability to create the right promotion and promote on anything and award anything that they want. And it does not always have to be a monetary reward. So we allow you to define promotion type that is best for you and your customers across the entire enterprise, including the various different brands. While we're talking about promotion types, I know something that sometimes you hear floated out there that archaic promotion types, maybe archaic isn't the right word, but promotion types of years past, let's say coupons, for example, don't necessarily work with today's consumer. And I know we were just talking about promotion types there. Obviously, some of the brands that you service leverage coupons a ton, and they are a very important part of a promotion platform. What role do things like coupons, like maybe promotion programs of the past, what role do they have in digital promotion platforms as well? That's a great question. And I've done a number of articles and spoken on this topic a few times. What people have to visualize is a different world. Don't think of coupons as what your parents may have had and clipped out of the local newspaper and used and went to the store and had a, a pile of them and, you know, spent an extra 20 minutes in line processing a uh, checkout. Now, digital coupons are a very effective way of presenting offers, promotions to your customers and doing personalized promotions. We have a number of different retailers that we work with that create their promotions through coupons or digital offers that they can target specifically to that particular customer and what they want to do. So personalized promotions, personalized offers to that customer, driving that customer loyalty. And they have the ability in integrating into their internal systems to have those digital coupons attached to their account that they can clip down into their account and they automatically execute at the point of sales, whether that's on, online or in the store. So you don't have to actually go in and clip or present any sort of coupon or barcode. It's automatically attached to your account. Very effective way of creating personalization within your organization. And essentially, a digital coupon is a promotion. Now, we've talked a little bit about the development of effective promotion platforms, but I also wanted to discuss a little bit about the evaluation of these platforms. You mentioned it in one of your early answers that it's important to build a platform that works for now as well as the unknown future, for example. When you have developed a promotion platform, when you're employing that, when you're putting it into play, what are some ways in which you can evaluate how that platform's working and maybe how it needs to evolve or grow? What are some, if not internal metrics, so to speak, what are some ways you can look at that and say, hey, okay, this is how we need to develop it and this is what we need to do to keep it successful in the future? 
Well, the first thing is, is whenever you're looking at your current system, is it supporting your business? What is driving it? What is it supporting your business objectives, right? So in other words, you're defining your business objectives and your promotional campaigns first, and then you're implementing into your promotion platform. Or is it the reverse where your promotion platform today is saying, here's the limitations of what you can work within. And then now you're driving your promotion campaigns. If that's what's happening, then you have the wrong system. So if you're building your campaigns and you're saying to yourself, if we could increase sales only if we could run this type of promotion or offer, or if we would create personalized, sophisticated promotions, we could drive customer loyalty. Or that's a great idea for a campaign, but it would be nearly impossible for us to implement. You don't have to write solution. Your solution, the solution really should be around the creative process. And this is how you can evaluate it, is as a retailer, as a marketing executive, if you're defining your business objectives and your promotional campaigns independently of your platform, then you have the right platform in place and you will be able to execute upon all of your objectives and grow your business. Because ultimately that's what you're trying to do is grow sales, right? And drive customer loyalty. So looking at that, I know evaluation obviously is important. Development and continued development is important. But given that this is something that you do day in, day out, I'm curious, when you look out at the landscape of other retail promotion platforms, you talked about it certainly in a general sense where you want all types of compatibility, you want that flexibility, but what are some areas of opportunity that you feel as though retailers could or maybe should take advantage of going forward? There's a couple of great examples. So number one is, as I mentioned earlier, slashing prices or discounting is not going to win. It's a temporary fix. It might drive temporary sales increases, but it's not a long-term solution. So a couple of things I've talked about that are very key and what I see out there, right, is targeted promotions is probably the most talked about within the retail community, the retailers I'm speaking with. And what I mean by targeted promotions here is, is promotions only on what you want to promote. So some of the challenges with promotion platforms is it's too broad in what you're creating promotions. So you may want to promote on menswear, right? But you went very specifically menswear. And unfortunately, some platforms will say, okay, it's based on a department, right? So everything in this department or everything in this label, et cetera. It gives you a broad categorization of the promotion and applicable across all of those products. What I'm hearing more and more is retailers want that ability to drive down almost to the actual and very specific, that particular size and that particular color is what I want to promote on. They only want to promote on certain items. And there's a large number of reasons for that. Each retailer has their specific reasons, but it could be by the fact that right now, because of supply chain issues we've had over the last little while, they have a shortage of products and therefore demand is exceeding the supply. So therefore they don't need to promote it on that particular product, but they may need to promote on other products. So targeted promotions is probably what I'm hearing the most in the industry. Personalization, I covered off. Everybody wants that ability to create a personalized promotion for that particular customer. If this person likes a specific style of clothing, right, or buy certain types of shoes, et cetera, you want to be able to provide that personalized offer to that customer, right? But creativity, so creativity is a big one that we hear about. So I've talked a lot about, you know, promotions and the monetary side of things, right? And, and prices and different promotion types, but a promotion does not always have to be, the reward does not always have to be a monetary reward. It could be a non-monetary promotion, right? So this is how someone could increase their brand message. So a brand may have a specific CSR program. For example, you know, promoting clothing made from sustainable materials. 
they can create promotions that are very specific to that, again, targeted product, right? So here's all your products that are of sustainable materials and we want to promote, et cetera, on that, right? So you can create those promotions around that, that promotes your brand and your message. Or it could be a charity, you can create promotions that are community-based or charity-based. The example I give out sometimes and we've seen is, especially around this time of the year where we've just gone through the holiday season and many times retailers, you know, they'll ask you as you're going through the checkout, would you like to make a donation to the local food bank? So again, retailers can set a promotion that says, we'll make a $2 as an example, $2 contribution to the local food bank based on every $50 you spend at our grocery store. So those are the types of things that you can be a little bit more creative with in your promotions. And those are really what you should be putting into your platform and evaluating your platform is the ability to have that creativity and that targeted promotion. It's a great point there. Not always about reducing that dollar amount that that customer pays, but sometimes building that brand loyalty through other steps as well. Now, of course, we know promotion platforms are designed to build a customer base, retain that customer base. That's oftentimes the main goal of them, but there's fringe benefits to them as well. And I know in retail, as in a number of other industries, we begin to talk a lot about data and useful data as far as retailers are concerned. And I'm curious from your standpoint, what type of data is generated by a good promotion platform that maybe retailers can leverage, not just for their promotion platform, but for other things going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. And one we hear a lot from prospective retailers is, you know, what data do you create in, in that? So first off, data is always important to understand what worked, what didn't work and why. But the challenge is there's a number of external factors that impact sales and the effectiveness of a promotional campaign. We could go all the way down to something like weather could significantly impact a promotion, right? Positively or negatively. The other challenge we see often is that every retailer is looking for a little bit of a different analysis around what they're trying to do with the promotional data. So, you know, over the years, and like I said, we've been doing this for 20 years in XE Commerce, what we've done is we give the retailer the flexibility to capture the data that's needed for their analysis. So we've got a little bit more flexibility around what exactly you capture, right? And how you capture that information. So some examples of that is the promotion that was applicable, the promotion that was considered, those are captured and what else was in the basket, right? So you wanna understand that this promotion drive up additional sales, increase the basket size and, and the value of the transaction, right? The number of times a promotion is given and processed is also another key piece of information because that gives you an indication of how well it worked compared to what you were expecting. Also promotions that were considered, right? So sometimes a promotion, as you process a basket and you determine what promotions are given, you also should be getting back and recording what promotions were considered and how close were they to that threshold, but were not met. That's important for evaluating how well your promotion is performing. And is it driving that incremental spend from your customers? And then of course, capture the total basket spend and whether or not they were a loyalty customer. All this information, these are examples of things that should be captured. And there's multiple other items as well, but we give you the flexibility around what is captured so it can be processed and analyzed appropriately. Seems as though the overarching theme there, flexibility, not only in terms of the platform, but also in terms of benefits from the retailer from the platform as well. Well, Dan, once again, we thank you taking the time out of your busy schedule here in the new year to join us. And we appreciate you shining some light on a subject we honestly don't talk a whole lot about here on the show. My pleasure, Trent, and thanks very much for your time. As always, we may have a position in or against companies we discuss on the podcast. Do not invest in stocks solely on the input of the podcast hosts.
We thank Dan for joining us here on the show. And as we alluded to during the interview, and as I said before the interview, you know, this isn't something that we talk a lot about in terms of the technical aspects of promotion platforms, but boy, are they ever important. You hear retailers all the time talk about the importance of promotions and promotion platforms as far as driving that traffic. And I got to say, it's kind of interesting, once you know how the sausage is made, to go out to those retailers and look at how they run their promotion platforms and some of the flexibility they are able to leverage as a result of a promotion platform like XC Commerce. Well, in our Looking Ahead segment, I wanted to look ahead to Earth Fair. This was a company that was really kind of struggling over the last couple of years, taken over in 2020. And as a result, you're seeing kind of a refresh, if you will, on Earth Fair. Now, Earth Fair, just so that you know a little bit of a background regarding the company, they were originally founded in 1975 in Asheville, North Carolina. The newest takeover took place in 2020, and they currently have just over 20 stores in the U.S., most of these located in the southeastern United States, including that grocery hotbed of Knoxville, Tennessee, that we talked about extensively in last week's podcast. Their furthest north location I actually visited this past week. That location is in Portage, Michigan, which is kind of a suburb, if you will, of Kalamazoo. Portage borders Kalamazoo right next to one another. They also have a location in Canton, Ohio. But as I was doing a little bit of research on the company and as I was visiting that location in Portage, I noted that they've actually got some pretty decent plans coming up for expansion. They're looking at opening up three locations. One, in fact, in Christiansburg, Virginia, is scheduled to open up this next week on January 12th. Oldsmar, Florida, also among them. And then back up north in Cleveland, Ohio. So kind of filling out the northern region in terms of distribution and the like. You know, Earth Fair is just one of a number of natural type food stores that have opened up in the upper Midwest. You look at a grocery store chain like Fresh Time, you've obviously got competition coming from the likes of Whole Foods. In the South, they've got competition coming from the likes of the Fresh Market. And of course, Natural Grocers is expanding. So really, I'm looking ahead to see just how far and how quickly Earth Fair is willing to expand. Obviously, with those three locations coming in northern climes, so you've got two in Ohio and one in Michigan, you really wonder how distribution is working for them and whether it's able to work effectively, whether they see that as a region where they can really grow into. And again, this is a retailer where they were, for lack of a better term, you don't want to put it this way necessarily, but they were on life support until just a couple of years ago. They were taken over in 2020 under new investors, kind of installed new leadership after stagnating a little bit. And so now they're re-expanding, but you just wonder if maybe this expansion is going too quickly. Maybe if they're not expanding to the right areas in the U.S. We've talked about the Southeast certainly being a hotbed for all kinds of grocery stores. I would like to see this chain succeed, of course, and it's one of those chains where you go into it, it's got certainly a, a feel, a vibe very similar to the likes of a Whole Foods. Fresh time, I would equate a little bit more to Sprouts in that category, but ultimately, you want to see this business succeed, but sometimes, especially after a takeover of new leadership, you see expansion just maybe happening a little bit too quick, and I certainly don't want that to be the case for Earth Fair, but I'm going to be keeping an eye on them, certainly in the year ahead. They've expanded dramatically since 2020, at least continued that expansion through the first couple of months of 2022, and we'll see if they manage to eclipse the 30 location mark nationwide by the end of this year. Well, that'll do it for us here on the Retail Focus Podcast. I'm Trent for Layton Behind the Scenes. We appreciate you listening. We appreciate Dan Surtees for joining us, and we'll be back with you seven days from now. This has been the Retail Focus Podcast. For more, visit our website at retailfocuspodcast.com and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. Follow us on Twitter at Retail Podcast.